First, a few thank yous. Thank you very much to Chloe, Sam and Paul for inviting me to give this. Um, lots of this is kind of side research. I've not written anything explicitly on this, but it's stuff I've constantly got in notes. Uh, I'm sure everyone is the same, particularly with games. You pick up so many things that you put a secrete in little places for a future time where they can come in handy. Um, and also, it's just a chance to talk about um, some things that I find interesting and some things which I find disappointing. Um, there's quite a lot of disappointment in the paper um, <laughs> about the ways in which people feel obligated to shoehorn Shakespeare into games or to shoehorn games into Shakespeare. And I'm going to raise some questions. I haven't got loads of answers, but hopefully we can bring up some discussion at the end as to how successful these attempts really are and what really makes a good Shakespeare game or a good gamified Shakespeare um, I've got a few board, um, paper and card versions I'm going to work through. So the paper, I want to introduce some links between Shakespeare and games, so kind of broad areas of where those two might fit together. This sounds really posh, I'm not, I'm not really a ludic scholar, I'm much more a narratist, narrative guy, so outline the different ludic approaches applied to Shakespeare, that's kind of board, card, video, etc. Um, I'm going to provide a survey of some notable examples, and then conclude by leading in some, some created Shakespeare gaming. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I've not played either of the big games before. Surprisingly, my family don't want to play games based on Shakespeare, <laughs> particularly ones with so many pieces. They make the dramatic person I to a Johnson play look easygoing. That's a really <laughs> niche joke. I'm sorry about that. They're not always so niche. Um, so the idea is to kind of introduce the way in which games and Shakespeare can work together, the way in which sometimes they work together really badly, but also to start raising questions about what can the two different disciplines do by interacting with each other? Is there something we can gain from it, other than the obvious, you stick Shakespeare in anything you do because it sells books, it gets funding. It's a really cynical thing sometimes to do so. So, brilliant example of how to draw Shakespeare. I like this one, it's always a good slide. Um, what's in a game? Why, why do we think about games? This is where I remember I've actually got notes on my tablet, which is in here. Um, so what I'm thinking about here is why do we maybe link ideas of play, as in the experience of playing, the immersive nature of playing, alongside the idea of a play. Um, obviously there's the, the similarity in, in Lexus, they are the same word, but they do work in very different ways. One of the things I'm really interested in, in the kind of way in which playing with Shakespeare breaks down previous boundaries, is that the early examples of Shakespearean theatre, when you think of the globe, is more immersive, it's kind of a 360 experience, it's not the proscenium arch blocked off audience to, um, to actor, and that's kind of what we're working towards in gaming, the move towards VR is an attempt to kind of tread back that retrograde move away from immersive that we've seen in theatre and in media more generally. Right. We're going to wait for Dropbox to work. So what I'm thinking of here is in terms of ideas of immersion, of iterability in a Derridean sense in terms of text, but also the replayability of a game, and is that the same thing, is it a variation of that, alongside the different way you can adapt to play. Um, how many here have been to see Shakespeare plays? <gasps> wow, you're all ace, you can go to the top of the class. If you're all there, it's not really the top anymore, but you know, I'm sure there'll be something in the Tez about that, elevating the grading. Um, There's always a ringer there who's paid to just understand <laughs> the jokes and then they laugh. It's I didn't understand much. <laughs> that's fine. There's not a lot of Shakespearean language today, don't worry, because that's something that I'm going to be talking about in terms of the way in which games can be used as a way into understanding the themes and ideas of Shakespeare. But often the themes and ideas of Shakespeare that are expressed in the games are very conservative and very deliberately point towards a way of reading the plays which actually doesn't get you very far. So it's kind of a, it closes down understanding rather than opens up usually under the auspices of being about accessibility. There's something really quite pernicious about the way this often works. Um, so yeah, so ideas of atmosphere, audience involvement. There's rules, but there's also potentiality. And that's something I'm really interested in terms of theatre. I watched the, um, the debates, the, the, the savage debates between uh, liter narrative studies and ludology over the past, what, couple of decades in game studies. Uh, really interestingly, because it reminded me a lot of the long-running debates in Shakespeare studies, and theatre studies more broadly between text and production studies. So, you know, the whole page versus the stage, you're looking at a very similar kind of reenactment of those arguments. So, from my mind, I found it quite reductive. I don't know who here is worships at the Church of Ludology. Anybody a diehard Ludologist? 
No, that's good. That's good. There you are. That's much easier for me. Uh, there is room for a uh, discussion of mechanics. There's some element here where I bring in mechanics, but I'm interested in what those mechanics mean to the experience of playing rather than analysing the mechanics themselves for what they are and how they work. I think that's a different discourse, one that I'm not qualified to get into, and one that, to be honest, doesn't interest me massively. One thing I find really interesting with Shakespeare is he's actually relatively uninterested in games and play. Um, other playwrights, particularly Thomas Middleton, the fantastic Thomas Middleton. How many of you have seen or read a Thomas Middleton play? Wow, you're, you're just the best. Can I come here every week? Um, when you look, if you do a, a really basic um, concordant search of Shakespeare and look for uses of the word game or games, you find 76 use of game. Then you look closely, this is a real kind of lesson in the benefits and drawbacks of um, corpus linguistics. About 40 of those are for Agamemnon, which contains the word game. It's like the, the Scunthorpe issue all over again. Um, so you, you know, if you look, you think, oh, he must be interested, 76 mentions. But when you look deeper, actually, it's like, no, he doesn't care at all. There's a few mentions where game is used in terms of military conquest. It's often used in terms of hunting. Um, plays like Henry V mention games a fair amount because it, the warfare is seen as a game. And for those that know Henry V, there's a, a really kind of developed side to do with some tennis balls and how it's an insult to Henry as a gift from the French Dauphin. But on the whole, Shakespeare doesn't really do games. Um, and that might not be surprising because how much do we know about early modern games? This isn't a paper about early modern games at all um, because that's not my area. But there are some kind of records of particular games. Um, the image I used and sent to Sam for the poster was of a very early backgammon board. Um, really interestingly on that, it's the frontispiece to a domestic tragedy. So this backgammon board was obviously a domestic thing. So it was in the house. And that in and of itself is really interesting because games, obviously, particularly in the modern period, are often more associated with going to games. You know, you think of all the controversies around early modern football. Um, my injury was a football injury, so I'm going to stick to games rather than sports from now on. Um, but one really good use of games in the early modern period is by Thomas Middleton, 1624. His game at chess, the entire play is staged as a game of chess. All of the characters in it are black queen, fat bishop, Fat Bishop, you've got to love that as a title. Um, and this was done deliberately because it was a really clearly coded, but not very subtly, criticism of current political events. So the black characters are the Spanish, the white characters are the English. It ends with a victory of the white characters. But it only was performed for nine different occasions. Apparently it was a massive box office success, but then was banned because you're not allowed to stage current monarchs on the, the early modern stage. So in being that obvious an allegory, it was, it was crossing the line. But it was obviously really popular, worked really well. It's a fascinating play to, what? to, to watch or to read. I love the way in which every character, when they are finished off, go into the bag. So obviously you keep your chess pieces in the bag, and that bag represents hell. So next time you play chess or Scrabble, when you reach into that velvet bag, or the bag you keep your dice in, just remember, that's hell. That's what happens, not to feel guilty every time you go and watch that. Um, and this is obviously a really exam early example of people bringing politics into games. Um, so it's not just Battlefield Five and most recent things where politics have been inserted. So to be begin the Shakespeare part and ask the audience, everyone loves these, what does Shakespeare mean to you? First word that flings to mind. Science. <laughs> so honestly. <laughs> Yeah, no, that I totally agree. My work is often in medical approaches and the way Shakespeare actually, because he's got no medical training as far as we know, surprisingly knows an awful lot. Making words up. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that great? You make words up, Chloe. I've read your work. I've heard you pretend that you're Yorkshire. Dated <laughs> <laughs> language. <gasps> Ooh, yeah. Not what we speak. No. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a form of language we understand, but not quite which obviously is, it, it, you have to, like when you're playing a new game, you have to acclimatise yourself, you have to get used to the rules, and once you know how it works, it's much easier. When you try and open up somebody who's new to it, it's not so simple. I mean, anyone who's tried to introduce a member of the family or a friend to a board game they're familiar with, you're used to that. It's an obstacle, but it's there as part of the learning process. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something we should be aware of, yeah? Sarah looks like she's... Sorry, Laura? Fantasy. <gasps> Yeah, so Shakespeare presents less historical time period and less historical places. 
But he doesn't go there and make it all up because it's completely not done. Yeah. So again, much like game designers, it's an idea of taking a structure and inventing that you, well, you can never experience. He never experienced, but he was able to experience. I mean, some of these are quite laboured ways of connecting Shakespeare and games, but I'm, the idea I'm trying to get across is that there aren't, it's actually quite close to the intellectual exercise of writing an early modern play as creating a game. There's a series of rules, mechanics, expectations you have to work within, and with alongside that, there are ways in which you try to break it in each time to make your, your particular play or game different. Because people have to know what it is to understand how it works, but you also want to make it slightly different. If you wrote something that was completely out there, then no one can understand how it works. And the same with if you had a board game with no rules and no pieces, no one knows how to play it. So these kind of ideas are always kind of key to the different ways. I'm glad none of you kind of said boring. I did this exercise with a year 10 group a few weeks ago, and the look on the teachers' faces was so precious because they were like, all the kids were like, boring. Plus they're giving them coffee. Year 10s and coffee at, at 10 in the morning, <laughs> and I gave them free reign, and then I mentioned prostitution in the globe, and all oh, the, the faces <laughs> were amazing. Um, I don't know if I'll be invited to do that one again. No, apparently the feedback was really good, and apparently at lunch the kids were talking about Shakespeare. Wow. My work was done. No, I don't know how they were talking about it. But the idea is that everyone always shoehorns fun educational activities involving Shakespeare. And I've done this myself. I've done public events where you have Shakespeare colouring, Shakespeare crosswords, Shakespeare word searches. And yeah, they're not games, they're kind of activities, but they're within the same kind of idea of fun processes. That I'm not going to get down to the definition of games. I'm sure some of you will know that better than me. But I think they do work within this idea of gaming more broadly. And the idea is, they might, you might understand the language, you might not understand the theme, but at least you're doing something with Shakespeare, which is brilliant, probably. But if you don't go any further than that, is there any point, really? And sometimes I find this approach is quite defeatist. It's almost accepting the work is challenging, so we won't do the work, we'll just give them a crossword. Instead of, let's actually break down what's happening in a scene from a play. Uh, many years ago in a previous life, when I was trained to be a secondary school teacher, I did a teacher in role role play with a special needs year eight group on Macbeth, where I role played Macbeth. I didn't do the accent. And the responses I got from them, from that face-to-face -face involvement, was better than I've had from undergraduate students who have read the text throughout because they were actually forced to engage with it. And the problem with this kind of gaming approach to Shakespeare is you're kind of leaving the Shakespeare behind. And it's lip service to a Shakespearean engagement, which I think isn't really helping anyone. That's not to say these are necessarily bad things to do. They can be quite a good way in classroom to introduce people to new words. Crosswords particularly can be quite good if you have a, you know, a, a modern definition, people have to find the word from the, origin, from the original text next to it. But when it's just a list of words and put it in a grid, you know, that's not really teaching you anything. So this kind of way of moving stuff, there's also this kind of mock way of having a Shakespearean language. So clicketh again to begin. Clicketh. I've looked. I don't see that in any Shakespearean play. But this is kind of, it's almost Shakespearean drag. And it's done deliberately to kind of mock, you know, you know the oldie. That no one said ye oldie. The e was just an, you know, it just said ye old. And it's this kind of idea of performing a Shakespearean thing, which just doesn't do anything any justice. And it seems, for me, it annoys me. You might have picked that up. There's a bit of annoyance here. Um, and some, sometimes that's all people get in terms of Shakespeare. And that's never really good enough. The Globe has a whole section on educational things where they've got a set of animals, the beasts of the Globe, who enact different elements of Shakespeare's world. They have kind of names based on figures from Shakespeare's time. And there are a range of activities and games, and they're all kind of linked to the globe. And this is all right. I think this works pretty well. It's engaging. It's got a kind of Hey Dougie style. That's one for all the parents in the room. Um, you can see the appeal of it. It's linked throughout the different things. So people can start with the activities, move on to the games. And these characters are used in some of the more kind of ed explicitly educational exercises as well. So the games are a way into a wider involvement, a wider engagement. They're actually integral to it. They're part of something educational, fun, 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 fun educational, we call it, in, in a way that, that a lot of these exercises aren't. It's not just, here's the Shakespeare, but here's the fun we'll do instead of the Shakespeare. It's, let's do something more involved. There's a really bizarre history. One of these games apparently is a reskin version of a game that was banned because it, it depicted the war in Syria, which is like, what? How? And it, purely the engine was reused, but it's like, just do a search on random, um, looking through the kind of history of who made it, and it's like, this banned game. I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. It was just like, we just completely reskinned it. And there's a really interesting analogy there between the way in which game engines form the base of so many games and the way in which the bare bones of a plot and a play 
are reused across different playwrights and the way in which the, you know, the, the five act structure of a play is the game engine effectively of the early modern stage and yet what you can do at the end can be as varied as a bear running a playhouse or a biting satire about the state of the Syrian polit political system. Um, it's about the potentiality. The mechanics are only so far, but it's what you then do with them beyond that. So I think that the Globe Game Portal works really well. Um, I haven't yet tried it on my kids. I might well do so. Um, when they've been really naughty, I might sit them down. They kind of, they recognise Shakespeare. My seven-year-old can recognise Shakespeare. Um, although the first time he did a colouring in of Shakespeare in a museum, he decided that he was called Ron. So in our house, he's referred to as Ron all the time to kind of bemuse the looks by anyone else. So there's another way in which these games are used. This particular game got massive cultural exposure. Apparently at one point there were like 7 million people around the world playing it. It sucks, obviously. It's a flash-based browser game where you play as Romeo jumping around like Mario to collect roses to move on to the next level. It's absolutely rudimentary, but you, there's, an there's an element to make it a game. You can see all the actual basics of game design there. There's a challenge, there's a structure, there are levels. If you get to the level without collecting the roses, Shakespeare sends you back to get them. So you can see there being actually all the rudimentary elements of a, a game as we know it. Uh, and so in that case, it was really popular. Um, but obviously, it's just an advertising piece for Shakespeare Country, which is a whole industry in of itself. And the problem here is that you've got a kind of the multiple significance of Shakespeare and the Shakespeare business. So you've got the global role of Shakespeare, the industry, the cultural pillar, the central figure of, of English language. You've got the national role, which is this emblem of Englishness. I mean, what is that at the bottom? Explore England's England. <laughs> that, that's nothing. That's like, it's not just tautology. It's just, it's rubbish. It's like, it's pure Brexit. Um, and this is years old. This predates Brexit. The best thing about Brexit is Shakespeare's plays are brilliant arguments against Brexit. If you read Cymbeline, King John, or Henry V with Brexit in mind, Farage, Johnson, they all fit so well. And they're all examples of inglorious figures who want to break ties with, the, with Europe to further their own ends and then realise, actually, they're not self-sufficient. They fall down because they're villains. If only real life was as tidy <laughs> as a Shakespeare play um, in the ending. But yeah, so you've got this game in particular, which was a, pro, you know, was, was a game. It meant to be a game rather than just an activity. And yes, it was quite cynical. It's not, it's not particularly great, but it was serving a purpose. And there's this kind of real urge, particularly it was an idea that Shakespeare on his own wasn't going to be enough to get people involved. So there was an idea to bring a game in that would get people talking. Um, you, know, you can win the weekend break. It links to a page that tells you about all the things you can do in Shakespeare country not many of which actually involve Shakespeare, bizarrely, or maybe. And the best thing about Shakespeare Country is the website is, and the, the people who run the website, website are based in Hertfordshire, which is nowhere near Shakespeare Country. So, hmm, wonder what's going on there. Um, and obviously, as a game works, and as I, when I play games, I broke it. Um, this is a, a wall, you're not supposed to be in here. Uh, Romeo, wherefore art thou? I'm stuck in a wall, love. Um, don't know what's gonna happen. Um, I tried for ages to get out and, yeah, it wasn't happening, so that was that was fun. Um, <laughs> it's what I, I kind of, whenever I play a game, I tend to break it somehow. I don't know why, it's just years of, of always trying to push it. I do the same with plays in many ways. And this is kind of, this is playing against the game, reading against the grain of the, the actual narrative. So what you've got here is this kind of level of ownership, because alongside this kind of national and cultural figure, you've also got the parochial, the local idea of our Shakespeare, which is rather Stratford Shakespeare, or it's London's Globe Shakespeare. And those two always are conflicting and competing, and it's about pay getting bums on seats. I mean, they're the Microsoft and Sony of that industry. And they're always about authenticity, which one is the place to go. But in a way, they're always kind of more interested in furthering their own um, tourism end than they are in, in actually getting to the bottom of anything about what Shakespeare is and what he means. So I wouldn't go to any of these kind of sites to get any insight into Shakespeare the figure or Shakespeare the playwright, but it will tell you about Shakespeare the brand. And so here we have the Exploring England again. I loved it so much I put it on twice. And so you've got this kind of, this commercialising of Shakespeare, this making him a web presence. There's, um, I didn't include it because it was a really kind of rudimentary, um, on, it was like a GeoCities page from early 2000s, which did a search on, on an early version of Google as a number of times big brands were mentioned and the biggest two brands were God and Shakespeare, which is interesting in of itself, but it's a very dated site. But um, this idea that, it does shape stands for something outside of any of his works, anything else. He's now a commercial entity. You can, you can put Shakespeare on literally anything. And there's a few examples of things you can put Shakespeare on. So Shakespeare on socks. 
Lady Macbeth's guest soap, which will guarantee to get out that damned spot. Um, Shakespeare perfume, Shakespeare... I didn't look on kind of adult, but I'm sure there are adult versions of them as well. But basically, you can slap Shakespeare on anything and someone will buy it. I mean, this isn't just Shakespeare, though. In the paper I gave a couple of weeks ago about early modern martyrology the, the sites, the way in which a lot of these image-based boards work is you can put any image on merchandise. And so I had a picture that was a saint being sawed in half with a really kind of rudimentary but, but deadly looking saw. And next to it, have this on a pillow <laughs> for the, for the, the, the sad, sadistic Catholic in your life, maybe. <laughs> uh, and so there's this kind of weird thing that once, and it, even though this is very internet based, the way this works and the way in which kind of open source printing works now and any image can be put on anything, it seems to be much more in keeping with what people have done with Shakespeare over the centuries. So Shakespeare seems really suited to this kind of open source approach um, in the same way that um, it seems to be kind of grabbed by whatever new technology. Shakespeare always seems to fit whatever new technology because it's kind of amorphous. Um, this kind of works really well in, in the way that obviously alongside the Shakespeare brand, the Shakespeare business, is that Shakespeare completely overshadows everyone else who was writing in his, in his period. And that, as an early modernist who likes Shakespeare, I've written on Shakespeare a lot, but there are lots of really good other playwrights. It kind of overshadows it, and I think that will be familiar to anyone here who plays video games or who plays anything. It's the big names are always the ones that attract everything. So World of Warcraft is everywhere. It's still, even though it's not really going on much. Um, Call of Duty. When if you look for an academic book about games, it will mention the big titles all the time, at the neglect of any of the ones that are perhaps more interesting. We're starting to move around, I think, as game studies becomes a little bit more mature, and people are kind of not not having to justify what they're writing about because of it being popular anymore. I think that, that's always been the case for the past sort of decade is that you have to go with the big hitters to get a mainstream audience when actually they're sometimes the least interesting things to write about or the most overdone. And yet Shakespeare still does that. You know, most Shakespeare plays, there's not a lot more you can say about them, but it's dominated so much. So when I see a lot of games writing, again, I can see these kind of weird um, repercussions, these replaying of debates that are going on in Shakespeare studies, which why I'm kind of uniquely, not quite uniquely, but I'm in a place, position where I can see them from both sides. Um, so it annoys me, um, depresses me, um, and, and, but also there's the optimistic side, maybe we'll get past that. And I think there's a lot more focus on the kind of the indie game, the interesting game, the political game, rather than just the, the big shiny AAA release everyone's heard of. Um, they're a way in perhaps, but let's look beyond that and Shakespeare still needs to do something similar. I'm not going to read through all the long quote on here, but the idea being that this kind of idea of brand is helpful because it's about cultural purchase, the way in which Shakespeare can, you know, it's a name, it's, it's above and beyond anything that is actually Shakespeare. It's something that can be applied to anything. And then this series of new products from stage and film adaptations to souvenir money boxes, medallions and tea towels, um, the Shakespeare beanie baby, the bobblehead, the action figure, or the Shakespeare celebrity duck. Um, I've got a little mini Shakespeare figure that sits in front of my, TV, my um, computer monitor. I usually just swear at it and throw it around the room when I can't write very well. Um, but it, become, it no longer means anything Shakespeare, it's, just, it's empty. It's the same as having um, a Coke can label on something. It's no longer, it's been emptied of all its actual meaning and significance. And a, a lot of the times in which Shakespeare is used in game and other in remediations, the same thing's happening. It's sort of divorced of what it actually means. Um, and they're the least interesting examples of the form. And this can be seen within trouble with brands once you make something freely ac accessible. So you have the sl Shakespeare slot games. Um, you have to say very carefully. Um, so you have Richard III, so that's obviously Shakespeare. There are also Romeo and Juliet and Cleopatra versions. And who wants to play slot games with Shakespeare? I mean, they're not even in the attempt to make the game itself related. There's no mechanical link to Shakespeare. It's purely an aesthetic and a very limp kind of aesthetic at that. Um, and you can see by the fact that the similar is every other thing, Game of Thrones poker, Tolkien poker, whatever, um, whatever the current thing is. So Shakespeare's kind of used and abused in this kind of way as a brand. And it tells us nothing about Shakespeare. It doesn't really add to any cultural understanding of Shakespeare or any kind of, and it doesn't add to the game either. It's just there as an empty brand. Where it becomes more interesting is when we have examples of remediation and adaptation rather than just kind of a lazy, placing of Shakespeare the brand. Um, this kind of comic um, for remediation through the medium of penguins, I think is brilliant. I only came across this in work in putting this PowerPoint together, but I'm going to keep this safe for any time I have to kind of teach these ideas. 
because it's about I love the fact that it's the shock. It's a sudden like, oh yeah, that's what reunion is it, and that's really key. Rather than giving a long kind of quote from Bolter and oh, the other guy, yes, um, here penguins. Everyone loves penguins, but it's also the fact that these these remediations happen in both ways. You know, text can remediate forwards and backwards. There can be retro remediation. So a Shakespearean play, which might seem quite old-fashioned on the surface of it, can adopt modern sensibilities from whatever it's Brexit. I teach, um, I've got a series of slides where I teach Twelfth Night as a Shakespearean version of Love Island, with the same kind of notion of the editorialising, the putting people in a, in a position, putting them together, forcing an outcome, but only showing you what the playwright wants to see. So the playwright and the director of Love Island is exactly the same. And they're kind of being an interesting way in which we can use Shakespeare to retro remediate social media and other kind of ways of viewing. Um, so remediation is really useful, but it also works really interesting in terms of Shakespearean plays because Shakespearean texts were, the, were arguably the first ones to really look at remediating in the first place. With the birth of the printing presses, you had uh, much more in the way of images used. There was an interesting complex uh, synthesis between word and image in many examples. And so it opened up the potential for a kind of mass market remediation of ideas. Um, Sam mentioned the way in which Shakespeare to him means science. You know, he was remediating scientific understanding into plays in a way that was really exciting and still can be now. Everyone looks at me, whenever I say Shakespeare's exciting, I kind of get this ripple of, really, <laughs> really? Um, maybe it says more about my life than I see him as such. But some ways in which Shakespearean world is remediated. This was from back, I think it was 2013. It was using the Crytek engine, which any of you who are gamers will know was the engine that famously breaks PCs. Um, people now stress test their modern PCs like six years later on the Crisis engine with Crisis 1. It still won't play to full specs. Um, but a group of students put together a really impressive mapping of Shakespearean London to the Crisis engine. So they use this in a really fascinating way that actually increases our understanding of early modern and Shakespearean times through gaming technology. So this to me is a million times more innovative and interesting than any of the kind of previous examples of just sticking Shakespeare's name on something to make it Shakespearean. The only frustrating thing is I want to get in there. You know, I, maybe I play too much Assassin's Creed, but I'm kind of looking for the bits to climb up to, <laughs> to kill people, but that's just me. Um, but it just, it, it makes me actually really want to dive in and do something. That's the way in which a gaming world can have an immersiveness that we don't necessarily have when we're approaching Shakespeare elsewhere. So it gives us this, because we expect to be in amongst it. And we don't necessarily, we're so trained now when we go and see a play that it happens over there and we're in the audience, we're not allowed to even make a noise opening sweet wrappers. We, you know, we're completely divorced from it. And I think that's so far removed from what early modern theatre should be, that something like this is much closer to it. And I really say, I really want this to be a Skyrim mod and just to go in and stab some dragons up in early modern um, England. Um, equally, you have, I love the dramatic music on here, and we won't, might not see this. Um, there are so many examples of globe theatres made in Minecraft. I mean, how many of you have been interested in the way in which Minecraft is used to map out amazing things? A couple. I see, more interested in the Shakespeare than the Minecraft. What's going on? I should plug a project going on at Lancaster. Dawn Stobart, who came here a, a few weeks ago to talk about horror, she's working with Sally Bushell um, and James, I can't remember his surname, at Lancaster doing a project on using Minecraft to map literary worlds. And they're doing really exciting things where they're setting children basically literary criticism task within Minecraft worlds. So they have to go and find particular objects and then they go and read the extract from the book to see how that immersiveness enabled them to understand it better. Which again is a really good example of the way in which games and literature can work together in a way. I, mean, I just look at that sort of thing and just think, how do you have the time? <laughs> Normally when I play Minecraft, I end up digging a hole and falling <laughs> in it or going around hitting some chickens and then realizing, you know, expecting it to be like Zelda when the chickens start fighting back, but they never do. Um, where's the fun in hitting chickens if they don't try and kill you afterwards? Um, another thing, example, kind of rattling through some of these, um, these case studies is what's called Shakespeare VR in this kind of this BBC um, news article, um, but it's more AR, augmented reality, than VR, um, and it's not very successful. I'm not going to sell this as a great <laughs> example. It's very much kind of connect. Um, and anyone who's into gaming knows that's not a positive term. And equally, does it really help you get into the world? Is this any better than putting on a costume? 
surely putting a costume on is more involvement um, because all you're doing is making the silly man fall over on screen. And we all like doing that, that's a good thing to do, but is that in any way really helping us in, engage with the text or the, the game, the game that's wrapped around it? Um, and this is an example of the way in which universities often kind of attach technology to Shakespeare in a cynical, but you know, we are in a cynical world, in an exercise to get funding. Because Shakespeare, you can put Shakespeare into something and people are like, ooh, funding bodies think, oh yeah, people like Shakespeare, Shakespeare's good, that's canonical. So you can attach that to game studies, to technology, and suddenly you get access to a whole raft of kind of very conservative thinking funding bodies. And yet, to be honest, that, that's nothing. What does that do? That, do? that doesn't help us in any way whatsoever. Um, we can also, some of these pictures are quite scary and uncanny, I'm sorry about that. Um, the undiscovered country that was Second Life. Who here remembers Second Life? Yes. Wow. Some, see, I'm getting to that point now where there's some young people like, what's Second Life? I haven't even understood First Life yet. Second Life was going to be the best thing ever. Uh, is it still? If people I think it's still sort of kicking along in some kind of form. I did see while searching for videos, and I'll show you a choice video in a moment, um, a Shakespearean wedding where everyone looked like a Kardashian. There were so many pneumatic bodies on display. It was like, oh my God. Um, and yet, Second Life was thought to be the way into the digital world. It was going to be like, it was the Matrix. It was Neuromancer. It was the future. I love the expression, that was the future. That's wonderful in all sorts of ways. Um, and the, one of the ways in which people thought to make use of this, partly through commercialising Shakespeare, so you could buy a prop that was a Hamlet book, you could buy costumes that were Shakespearean costumes, and there was, wonderfully, the Shakespearean Second Life Company, whose aim, um, and I say aim in the broadest sense because it didn't look like it went very well, um, was to put on full productions of Shakespearean plays in Second Life. Yeah. Yeah. It would never actually get to the start of a production, but you put it up. And there was someone that was, it was on some kind of disability where they yeah. had never actually been able to get on stage, but they could like that. Yeah, and the actual openness is great. The problem was with it, it didn't, it didn't ever quite go, become accessible enough. It was quite a fringe thing. It was done in a way that became quite arch. And I don't think it opened up to people in a way that Second, because Second Life itself, I think, became a lot more closed than it was going to be when it first kicked off. So in a way, it's a victim of the technology not taking, matching the ambitions of it. Um, anything that gets people involved in Shakespeare who can't is great. And I think the idea that people can do these things um, is fantastic. And Shakespeare and play performance often is quite an ableist thing. Um, it, there, there's a cost element. There's uh, the idea of having to access a lot of these theatres not particularly accessible. And that's all great. Um, but what I found really odd with this is they didn't really make any use of the technology. And that was partly because it was new, partly because no one quite knew what to do with these things. And what you got was the equivalent of the Laurence Olivier um, films of Shakespeare from the 50s, where it was just a play on the screen, and this was just a play statically in the game. And so what I would like to see, I would love to see a version now where technology is improved and people are more kind of open and can do more with it. Um, with VR, with um, modern technology, that can make it everything they wanted it to be. Because the problem with the technology as it stood there is you end up with, a, with versions that look like bad cutscenes. And that, unfortunately, is the technological dis distance between the ambitions and what it can do. And it makes everything seem really stilted. And the problem there is I don't know who's going to get anything out of it. You know, I love the ambition, I love the ideas, but the end result was already dated at the time it was happening because the technology was never going to keep up with it. And I think that's something that we see also in that um, augmented reality. Often when um, academics who are into Shakespeare get hold of technology, they're not at the cutting edge. They get hold of a technology that's already kind of starting to get quite dated and start to apply it to Shakespeare. And so what you have is this kind of weird, uncanny linking between them. Kind of, it's like a Morrowind cut, cut scene. And that doesn't do service to anyone who's involved because of the technology and because of the involvement. And it's not meant as a laugh at these people doing something bad. It's a, the problem was the idea was never going to be mapped by the technology. Uh, and there's always this kind of dissonance between what you want to get in terms of a Shakespeare and what you can get from technology. The opening up is brilliant. The fact that you can make this truly accessible is fantastic. But it doesn't work, unfortunately. In that way, when you look at it now, it's already dated. Um, 
something about and it, it, uh, it shares a lot of the problems I have with screen versions of stage plays which again are brilliant in terms of making plays accessible to people who can't make particular productions but you're always restricted by the director's gaze so the good thing about going to see a play is you can look at the person acting but you can also look at the people reacting when you watch a performance it's always the star center stage it's using filmic techniques of close-up in a way that don't let you actually experience what's happening it's always mediated in that way and this kind of suffered from that a little bit as well um, but yeah it was a thing it worked for a while now we kind of to get into the kind of game side of it I'm going to go through some different ways in which gaming styles and gaming approaches are used with Shakespeare the first one is obviously words um, Chloe's going to hold up no Chloe's just going to start reading it rather than listen to me um, Ryan North is a fantastic um, comic writer he now writes the unbeatable squirrel girl um, but he started off doing kind of um, web comics and parody um, apps you can buy to be honest to be as an app as a game on Steam or as a book uh, and it works exactly as I say it's Hamlet crossed with fighting fantasy multiple choice choose your own adventure takes the, the core text but you obviously can go off on some very different tangents so it, rem it keeps the central idea you can play it straight you can just choose the options that are in the Shakespeare equivalent and you'll, re you'll read a version of the play or you can go off on one side and suddenly be attacked by killer robots from space um, Ophelia can just say sod Hamlet and run off with somebody <laughs> else so it gives you the it's all that potentiality it takes that core idea and just opens it up completely to be played with as a play should be you know it's not restricted it's an opening up it's a democratization of the Shakespearean source that's what I say because is it a brontosaurus or a bronte saurus <laughs> Because there, you know, there's always that plan there. Um, so for me, because I'm, I suppose, in my old age, I'm a radical Shakespearean, I love the idea of this because it's about democratization. It's about opening up to people who might not otherwise access it. Um, other people are a bit sniffy about it, but you know, they can be sniffy. I'm sure anyone who looks at games now, there is still a sniffiness around this. Um, there still is a kind of understanding why you're looking at things that are for kids. Um, and I just roll my eyes now um, and just try and look past it. Uh, I always have the luxury of saying because I'm doing Shakespeare I've kind of got that that shred of decency left where I can sort of ask a question about something horror and trashy and then follow up by something about sonnets so, you know I'm all right that's fine um, but I do aware I'm aware that it's, the problem with that is everyone's like why are you looking at these things and I'm sure you can tell me better than, than I can why we look at games and why it's important um, and examples of this I think are much more interesting about what they can do with Shakespeare's own words because when you go choosing all these, choosing all these different options the moments when Shakespeare's original words come through can tell us a lot about how we react to them. I liken it a lot to the first Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which is really good um, because it really combines the two bizarre worlds, juxtaposes them, and makes a brilliant political stance about the way in which the underclass, the zombies, are the servants, the working class, the unmentionables, um, in a fantastic way that I think works really well. But then, as it went on, Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, not so much. Android Karenna has got the best title, but I haven't brought myself to read it yet. But yeah, this, 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 these kind of mashups, I think, are really interesting and, and have a lot of interesting work to be done in terms of how they open up our understanding and our interaction with canonical texts in a way that breaks down those barriers of this is the best thing ever, how can you possibly criticise it? Throw in some killer robots, that's how you criticise it. Paradise Lost would be better with killer robots. You also have the very kind of simple word-based activities. Um, I think everyone at some point has been, if into literature, has been given a pack of Shakespearean fridge magnets and you work out the best way of writing rude poems on them if you're me or anybody else. This has kind of been furthered on. This particular game um, didn't do well at Kickstarter, unfortunately. I came across it too late because I would love to have picked up a copy. And it's kind of a card-based version of the storytelling Shakespearean poetry kit where you get out particular words and you have to make them into a story and you get characters that give you a way of telling the story and I think it would work really well and be a really good Shakespearean game but unfortunately not enough other people agreed with me to fund it on Kickstarter before I discovered it. You also get board games. Um, some of these um, round from, this is a 1960s one that looks tediously dull. Um, this, the plays I think is a very educational one it's targeted at uh, American educational market. The German Shakespeare the board game, which is all about the uh, industry of theatre building up. Um, I don't know my German games that well, but I think there is a kind of 
a push towards European games being about um, trading, about economies, and this is very much what this one uh, works on. You also have Shakespeare the Bard game, which I've got there, which again is hideously complicated. Uh, Remediation and Mediation, so the Kill Shakespeare board game, which I have with me, based on a fantastic series of comics um, in which all the characters of Shakespeare's plays are fighting out in a Games of Thrones style world. Uh, so you have the goodies and the baddies fighting out. Uh, William Shakespeare, he's like the god figure who writes the stories. His quill is the magical weapon within it. So it's really kind of knowing, but works really well. And they obviously know they're Shakespeare. Um, card games, including Shakespearean top trumps. There's a version on the Guardian site, which I'm not going to go into because um, this is getting very long all of a sudden. I've noticed with the timer on there. Um, in which the, uh, you have to guess what the play is from the quote and choose which category will be better on your card than the one next to it. The fact that it includes fancy ability um, is questionable um, <laughs> in many ways. Um, native cunning, dread. I love ham factor. Ham factor is a good one. Um, you won't be surprised that I got 20 straight away because you know I'm ace and I know my stuff. Um, but we can maybe leave that on if somebody wants to have a mess around with it. I can go back to this slide after the talk. Um, card games like uh, Council of Verona, which takes the setting of Romeo and Juliet and makes it into a kind of card-based trading game. I love the fact there's a gothic zombified version where the Romeo and Juliet are together at the end because Romeo and Juliet is a gothic comedy. It's not a tragedy at all. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that. Um, the, the Wonderful Munchkin, which I came after I bought Munchkin Deluxe, I saw there was a Shakespeare version and kicked myself because that would have been so much me. Um, Bars Dispense Profanity, which as you can tell from the name is Cards Against Humanity, and that is like the great, <laughs> you, can't, you can't beat that. I found that on Tumblr, and I was going to go through and find some combinations, and I thought, uh, no, give me a or give me some dick, but that's it, you can't beat that. Um, but then you also have video game versions, so you have the kind of really straight versions of video games, where they'll take a version of the play, and they'll just present it as a game. Hidden object games like doing this, because they have a really interesting, and more complex negotiation with literary fields than I think we often give them credit for because they're dismissed as casual games. Um, but they're often really interesting. So often empowering that they have female pr protagonists in a way that a lot of other games don't. They can be really well written at times. And I like hidden object games when I'm writing because you can play a couple of screens and then get back to your writing. They've got a real place to play. These two are not great examples, but they do basically just follow the play and you have to kind of find the object. At one point you have to get over a wall, so you have to find a ladder. It's that kind of level that almost is adventure games, but not quite. But it's very straight with the, the originals. Um, I'm not going to play this video, but it's on the slides for later. It's the PS3 ad that had this band of brothers as the, the voiceover. So you've got Solid Snake running up as somebody's reciting Shakespeare, which is quite a delicious juxtaposition in many ways. Uh, one of my favourite examples of a really innovative text that no one played, because it was from 2003, is a game called Lionheart Legacy of the Crusader, which is set in a really bizarre timescale. And it's obviously the Crusade, so it's medieval, but Galileo's a character, Shakespeare's a character. And it doesn't get much past them giving you fetch quests, but the idea of it is really interesting, because it's about this kind of amorphous melting pot of medieval, early modern culture, and how people don't know the difference in, gen in, in time zone. And everyone moves them together. Particularly timely when you, if any of you have followed the recent debates and controversies around the way in which medieval studies is being co opted by the alt right and by the neo Nazis because they see it as a time where they were just white people, so it was better back then um, in a really horrible way. And I think this kind of points to that kind of blurring of time and that misreading of time in a way that it couldn't have predicted. And the fact that it's about the Crusades already is problematic now because the Crusades, they weren't a good thing. I mean, that might not be a particularly radical thing to say anymore. Uh, Shakespeare's also been used in Silent Hill 3, which is kind of the forgotten stepchild of the Silent Hill games, where apparently, I've not yet played 3, but it was on hard mode, you had to find excerpts from eight different volumes and put them together, which is like the worst horror possible. It's a bibliography in a game. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Um, you get kind of weird, this is a Polish game. Um, Hamlet, or the last game about MMORPG features, shaders and product placement which, much like the Ryan, Ryan North books, takes Hamlet into bizarre categories. As a game, it doesn't do much. It's very closely linked to kind of browser games, where you click on one thing, it starts something off, and then you click on something else. Very simplistic, but you know, it's Hamlet with a giant octopus. Again, you can't go wrong with that. So it's about taking this idea of Shakespeare, relocating, remediating. Sometimes it's done intelligently, sometimes it isn't. 
forthcoming game I think looks really interesting but has been um, been years in pre-production unfortunately is based from um, Elsinore you play Ophelia and like Groundhog Day is a, a point of adventure where you replay the day multiple times to get different outcomes I think that's got so much potential to really open up what's happening behind the scenes of Hamlet not least in the use of Ophelia as a protagonist but also in the ideas of fate of rewriting fate of inevitability of making the different options because when you're watching Hamlet it is all about the choices he makes and here you're kind of getting behind that um, but the fact that it's not yet out it's so frustrating at least when I'm doing Shakespeare they're all done he's dead I know there are I, I hate coming soon I'm not used to it it's not my my day job um, other examples we'll rattle through quite quickly this is one I've been toying with recently and messing around with it's a very weird game it's basically a campus-based dating game with all the characters from Shakespeare that's Cleopatra who is a magic wielding uh, bratish cheerleader type um, it's got a really interesting aesthetic and it's got an awful lot of queer identities in it um, it brings in Shakespeare fairies furries um, and it does it in a really kind of interesting way that makes it about Shakespeare being open to all in that kind of broad church way that I think suits really well with the original material typically if you go onto the steam pages there are people who have said ban this sick filth keep it on deviant art <sighs> steam comments never look at them um, and the best example of a character that goes slightly weird is that's Henry VIII, <laughs> who is the eighth iteration of Henry, uh, who's created by Caliban, who's a wheelchair-bound monstrous inventor. So it really kind of absolutely plays with it. But it, it, you can see there being an origin of sorts when the original text. An example, um, and we're at the end now, a really interesting academic example is, is in the early 2000s, there was a massive grant of $250,000, which at the time was unheard of, for a group of academics to put up, to set up Arden, the world of William Shakespeare, which is supposed to be World of Warcraft, but with Shakespeare. And there was a great deal of publicity about this and the amount of money they raised, because in academic terms, $250,000 was an awful lot of money. In gaming terms, that get, doesn't even get you an engine, which is why the actual resultant game was just a plug-in for Neverwinter Nights. And when it was released, it fell completely on his ass because it was just lots of reading. There was no gameplay involved. It was fetch quests after 10 <coughs> minutes of dialogue, which is like the worst of everything. And even though they tried to model a kind of interesting Elizabethan style world, as with Second Life, the technology was so limited, you couldn't tell which building was which, so you never could find the place you had to, to take in the quest that you finally did. So no one played it. And the problem with this um, was it was set up by uh, an academic whose work was in the economies of online role-playing games, um, Edward Castronova, I think his name was, as my tablet seems to have died on me. Um, and it was done as an experiment to see how real-life people would engage in the economies of games through Shakespeare. And he freely admits, um, after it failed, that he only attached Shakespeare to it because it would get funding. Uh, because if he tried to do it with Tolkien, it wouldn't have got the fun in funding from the central bodies, and so it was done purely in that way. This is a really interesting, there was apparently going to be a second version, which was going to be more combat based, but nothing ever came of that. I wonder why, because who wants to play a game that's literally just literary game with combat? That's Dante's Inferno. I've played Dante's Inferno. No one else should. Um, in, my, in my case, the best Shakespeare game is the Shakespeare DLC to Typing of the Dead Zombies. So as you're exploring the mansion, you get to type in Quintessence of Dust um, and the zombies die. And again, you can't go wrong with monsters. Um, there's a couple of other examples of other things that will use early modern settings that aren't Shakespeare. So this is coming soon based on the textbooks of Simon Foreman. And it's a lot, apparently a lot of dick jokes they're selling this as, um, which again, we like from the earlier slide. The absolutely scary Great Fire of London. Has anyone played this? Because look at it. How? How do you understand that? It's like a million pieces. I look at that and I just come out in cold sweats. Um, but apparently it's brilliant and amazing if you've got the hours to set it up. Has it? Oh. Probably because of all the pieces. <laughs> At least the fellow who designed it runs the, the UK Game Fest. Right? Okay. So it's doing okay. Right. Because I've seen this, and as Chloe, and usually if I want to play a board game, I go to Chloe's because she has all of the board games, and I don't. She does. Borrow them all. Um, because they're just so expensive up front. Uh, a friend of mine in London is designing a card game which she's calling Seditious Libel. This is set in the late 1680s, where you have to set up rumours. And it's set in coffee houses, so it's all about the way in which you piece together 
elements of rumours to start off, kind of, and they all have different point scores. Um, so example of the rumours there, Elizabeth Cellier, the Popish midwife, conspires to burn London to the ground, her from the mouth of their gossiping barber, they promote the growth of popery and arbitrary government. So it uses effective kind of original artwork in a way that works really well. I think this is a great, and it's designed as a teaching aid as well as a fun game to play. I think this is again a better way of getting games into early modern studies because the idea is linked to a game that might be fun to play rather than just being attached to something that isn't. And finally, and I'll leave some of this playing here, um, this is a production in New Zealand, so unfortunately no one's going to fund me to go and watch it, Hamlet the video game, which may be either the greatest thing known to man or the worst abomination you could possibly imagine. I'm not really sure yet, and I'm kind of leaving it as the last word, because is this where Shakespeare and games needs to go, or is this somewhere Shakespeare and games should never have gone? Um, I can't comment on the acting from the trailer, but I think this is the most developed and enjoyable way in which someone has tried to take the core elements of Shakespeare, the poetry, the, play, the plays, the immersiveness, and the potentiality and the engagement of video games and push them together to produce something. <laughs> and yeah, so that's kind of my conclusion. And the questions really are, we've got Shakespeare, we've got video games, where do we put them together? Well, I've showed you examples across the past sort of 30 years in ways in which people have tried. No one, I think, has really successfully married the two yet. I don't know if that's because the people who use it are mainly um, either game studies um, or game designers who use it for the marketing purposes or academics who don't really know how games work who use it just because it's the new technology. I think what we need is a kind of a happy synthesis with people like yourselves who know games and are happy to want to know about Shakespeare and will do it for the right reasons. And maybe we can produce a version of Shakespeare in a game that actually is fun. So thank you for listening. Hopefully you've learned a few things. Um, the slides will all be up and that's it, if anyone wants to ask any questions.